Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, joining us for tonight's um, uh, primary care physician lecture. Uh, we have three um, musculoskeletal topics, uh, low back pain, joint replacement, and ortho origin care. Uh, doctors uh, Pulver, McGowan, and Skeels. So um, we are recording this uh, so that it can be viewed later for credit by others. Uh, would ask you to keep your uh, microphones muted, if you would. Um, what I thought we would do is if you have questions during one of the three topics, uh, either email me, Larry Blosser, or uh, put it in the chat. Um, and uh, at the end of the, the talk, I'll uh, read the questions that are in the chat or that have been emailed. Um, so with that, we'll kick it off with low back pain. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. I'm uh, Fran Pulver. I'm with Sports Spine and Joint. Um, been here about five years now, I guess. Um, and I am going to talk about low back pain. So first, uh, goals, review, diagnostics, treatment, um, treatment options, just basic uh, spine conditions most common things we see. So first thing, red flags. Um, and most of the time, you know, you can pick up these red flags just on history, um, uh, which, so fracture, compression fractures, um, you know, did the, is it a 75 year old elderly who fell or they didn't even have to fall, spontaneous compression fractures, osteoporotic osteoporotic compression fractures, cotta syndrome, uh, saddle anesthesia, uh, any bowel or bladder changes, same thing, spinal cord compression, um, do, and the kind of the early signs of spinal cord compression are, um, and I always ask this, this is part of the history, the, the several questions is, is there any balance changes? Um, uh, hand coordination problems, those are two things, two early signs of particularly cervical uh, spinal cord compression. Um, so balance, any changes in balance uh, and hand coordination. Tumor um, and infection. So, you know, tumor, obviously, if somebody comes in and says, I've recently been diagnosed with prostate cancer and I have this new onset low back pain, that's a big red flag, but the top, um, <clears throat> The top uh, cancer diagnosis, um, kidney, uh, prostate, I always think of this, BL, BLT kosher pickle, right? Um, uh, breast, uh, breast, lung, prostate, kidney. Testicular? No. Uh, B, breast, lung. I don't know. I'll, I'll come back to that. <laughs> um, uh, and then other medical problems, AAA, kidney stone, rheumatologic. And the, this AAA is, is pretty interesting. I had somebody not to maybe a year, year or two ago, had this weird thoracic, kind of lower thoracic back pain that certainly looked musculoskeletal. I ended up getting an MRI, and sure enough, he had a AAA and went to surgery. And so Certainly those things we don't see often, but we got to, you always have to remember them. Next, um, when to image. So this is always a big, uh, a big question. Um, X-ray to roll up fracture, you know, the big things are trauma, you know, obviously. Um, and if no improvement within four weeks, and this is kind of almost questionable, you know, um, if somebody's not going the way we want it to go, sometimes x-rays don't really change things either. So if I'm starting to head that way, um, I think for this, these are just kind of the standard recommendations. I probably would not even be getting x-rays at four weeks. Um, and you, if, if you do, it's just the, the standard three views. Um, and then advanced imaging, CT and MRI. So I kind of use this as the same 
like if for surgical planning um, that, and I always tell the patients the, the only true reasons for surgery are progressive numbness, tingling, weakness in the legs, pain we can't control in the legs, or anything that looks like it's pushing on the spinal cord or cauda equina. Um, those are really the only two, uh, or the only three, or handful of um, reasons for uh, to send somebody to a surgeon. Um, and of course, uh, if you're suspicious for one of those red flag items, um, uh, the imaging is going to come more sooner than later. Why not to order an MRI? Um, obviously, the cost, and I think we've talked a lot about that. Um, increased surgical rates. So there's a lot of a lot of things on. Uh, that show up on MRI that mean little, mean very little. Um, and early on when I was starting to practice, we would have radiologists that would read MRIs with like two millimeter disc bulges and three millimeter. And then they would say this about every single level and we would get, patients would get these MRIs and they call you freaking out. Oh my gosh, my back is horrible because I have a two millimeter disc bulge in five levels. So I think um, there are lots of things on an MRI that don't mean, don't, really don't mean anything. So you always have to correlate what those findings are with the patient's um, complaints and the physical exam. So that's where those increased surgical rates come in, decrease outcomes. So sometimes we'll start chasing things that really aren't even part of the problem. Um, and then it does not change conservative treatment options, um, especially early on. And when I go through with a patient what you, their treatment options are, and this is in some of the additional slides, but um, I almost, I, I rarely put MRI in there as, our, as part of the options, because early on it's not gonna, really not gonna do those MRIs. Um, not required for surgical or for um, spinal injections. Um, it hasn't really been shown. This came from a, a um, study from John Hopkins probably, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. It's been a little while. Um, basically showed that it didn't, that it didn't change whether you had an MRI, it wasn't going to change whether you were going to do an injection or not. Um, if they, it may change where you did it, but it really didn't change your initial decision. Um, so um, unless there's a red flag, unless you're worried about one of those um, handful of items, it's really not necessary. Um, okay, next slide. All right, so these are the things that so for spine care, and I'm not going to go a lot into physical exam and things like that, but when I see a patient, this is, um, and I've talked to them, examined them, I sit them down and I said, these are a handful of options. One, if you're not going to do surgery, one option is to do absolutely nothing. Um, and they go, I kind of say, well, that's, I'm not here for that. But, you know, I just want to make sure that they know that all these things are completely elective unless it's surgical, everything else is elective. One, um, medications, and I go through the handful of medication options, which we'll go through. Um, physical therapy, um, and with that, uh, chiropractor, um, massage, acupuncture, um, then we talk about injections, the different types of injections and the injections that would be appropriate for them. And then, as I always say, if all that fails and we're and you're getting any of these other things, progressive numbness, tingling, weakness, pain we can't control, or bowel or bladder, then it goes to surgery. So we usually end up in those first couple initially. All right, uh, medication management. So usually by the time it gets to us, um, you guys have already done these kind of, these the the at least the um, the acute management medications, um, so NSAIDs and 
Um, obviously, there are things that are we have to worry about with NSAIDs, kidney function, uh, cardiac disease. Um, and I didn't put Tylenol up there. I'm not sure why, but um, that's always a big one. <coughs> Probably the next most common is the neuropathic agents, the gabapentin, um, which is really the best thing we have for nerve pain. Um, pain medications, opioids, uh, traditional medications like that usually don't do anything for nerve pain. Um, I mean, I've seen people on crazy amounts of opioids and narcotic pain meds, and they, it doesn't really touch their nerve pain. So gabapentin is really the go-to for radicular pain. Lyrica, although it's newer, I think it's more expensive, although the prices really come down. Um, but I think people have more side effects with Lyrica, although it's a sister drug to gabapentin. I think the, the side effect profile is a little bit more. Um, since Involta, um, the tricyclics, I do use those, not nearly as much. Muscle relaxers for acute pain or acute muscle, um, uh, low back, muscular low back pain, that's appropriate. When it gets into the, I don't know, subacute to chronic, I don't think it's as helpful. You could do it at nighttime, maybe it helps people sleep, but I don't think it's really gonna, it doesn't really help their, their symptoms. And then the opioids which I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about the opioids because that's a whole other lecture in itself, so. All right, interventional management. So we have, what, a half a dozen things there. Um, the epidurals are probably the most common. Um, those are really the indications for that are radicular, radiculopathy, uh, um, uh, and, discogenic pain, degenerative disc disease, um, facet blocks, medial branch blocks, facet-mediated pain, um, SI joint injections, hip joint injections, um, with, uh, and then the other ones, vertebroplasty, spinal cord stimulator, those are the advanced ones. Those are Dr. Grombach's. Um, I don't, Mike, do you do uh, vertebroplasties and I do stems. And stems, I, I okay. Stems, yeah. So Mike Skeels, Cork Grombach, stimulators, uh, and then um, vertebroplasty in the pumps. I don't, I don't think Cork implants that many pumps. I know he manages them, but yeah, we'll do them as well. He'll so do Cork them. does the, the vertebros and kyphos and the pumps. All right. Next, so surgical management. Um, so if they get to the point where you've gone through all these and they have progressive numbness, tingling, weakness, <laughs> pain we can't control, or cauda equina, then um, we send them to the surgeon. Absolutely, I absolutely do not send people to the surgeon for back pain only. And I tell them there's no indication, um, and I, I've see, I'm, of course, seeing less and less in this. I saw somebody recently, which was kind of disturbing, and but he, this was a, he was not a COPC, he just was new to COPC, but he was 80-something, had a multi-level decompression, um, and it was, um, I think, a fell four to S1 fusion for low back pain only. And he's like, he was mad at the surgeon, I'm no better, I'm worse than I was when I was going in. It's like it was just the classic, um, the, the, just the, the classic wrong thing to do. Um, but, uh, and it was unfortunate because he was very active. He still played golf, and he's like, I haven't played golf since last year. And so, you know, kind of readdressing and going back and doing some physical therapy and trying to get him conditioned. And But it was really unfortunate because he was like, I'm, I can do less than I did going into it, and he promised me 80% improvement. Um, so there is no, uh, no very limited role for axial pain. Um, cauda equina, um, so if they're getting that uh, incontinence, saddle anesthesia, progressive weakness, um, and neurogenic claudication, not responding to conservative care. So, um, I always try conservative, even if they have severe 
stenosis. If they don't have cauda equina, I always try the conservative things. I say over over the years, I swear this the, the stenosis is severe and they're gonna go to a surgeon and we do physical therapy and they get better. And we hold off um, surgery for several years usually. Uh, injections, uh, I usually try. Um, sometimes if the stenosis is severe, they sometimes they don't tolerate the injections very well or they don't get as much improvement as someone with less severe stenosis, but I think it's always worth a try. All right, and then this is just some information about kind of outcomes with spinal fusion. Um, this was out of Washington, injured workers reported, 50% reported no change after a fusion, um, doubled the chances of additional surgery. And so uh, a lot of you have probably heard about this already, but so when you do a when you you do a fusion that that air that level does not move and that's the whole goal but then down the road the adjacent levels called adjacent level disease adjacent levels wear out faster leads to additional surgeries down the road so doing a fusion in a 40 year old even they have 40 more years to put wear and tear on um on those adjacent levels and then fusions associated with increase in disability, opiate, opiate use, prolonged work loss, and poor return to work status. So um, we try to avoid, when we get to the point of sending somebody to surgery, we really try to pick those folks that are have low fusion rates. Um, certainly there's indications for fusions, and that's really indications are for instability. Um, and or a curve, a scoli uh, scoliosis. And even the, some of the scoliosis ones do not need fusions. Um, and this just kind of re reiterates the same thing. Limited lumbar spinal fusion, uh, limit lumbar spinal fusions to limited indications. And that's what I was just saying, the um, instability um, and uh, only if they failed everything else. Um, so if somebody even has, if somebody has a grade two or certainly grade one spondylolisthesis, say they have a slip, um, and I've even, you know, I have a couple of grade two ones I'm taking care of and have not needed surgery. Um, so even if there's some instability, then they don't always need to go to surgery. Um, it does depend on their flexion extension and those kind of things. Please just send to us. Don't send to the surgeon right away. We can triage them. We can look at them and see if they, we can hold them off. Um, because even the young folks with the listhesis, if you try to hold off that fusion, that's going to save that adjacent level problems down the road. We can kind of hold that off as long as we can. All right, and so these are just some cases that um, I think I have four or five cases. <clears throat> uh, 38 year old female referred for an abnormal MRI low back pain. So this is probably the most common that 30 to 60 year old kind of population where we see them, they have low back pain. Maybe they have leg pain, maybe they don't. Um, they have some findings on their MRI, maybe so a small disc protrusion, maybe on one side, uh, a little larger disc protrusion or herniation on the other side. And then you have to take that and correlate with their symptoms. So um, for instance, this one, this uh, woman had uh, some intermittent radicular pain <clears throat> into her right leg, um, but her she was neurologically intact. She didn't have any numbness, tingling, or weakness. Um, conservative care, um, she got better, uh, no surgery, uh, no injections even, um, and she did really well. So um, this one is 86-year-old uh, female 
no trauma, acute on chronic severe low back pain, presents to the emergency room. <clears throat> X-ray showed a showed compression fractures, CT scan, uh, MRIs showed a new, an acute, showed some chronic fractures, also showed, showed an acute one. The kyphoplasty was recommended. They sent her home and then came into us the next day. Um, uh, she had an injection that day. Uh, she was Medicare. So we didn't need pre-authorization, got her into an injection, had a uh, kind of held her until we could have done, we could get a vertebroplasty in. That was done and she did really well. So the point of that is, is that, you know, we can do these things that, and not have them in the hospital. So if you send them over, all these procedures can be done uh, as an office procedure, which is gonna save them a lot of money. Okay, so this one is 56-year-old female, or 56-year-old male, um, referred with a history of a lumbar fusion, recurrent and lumbar radiculopathy. Um, the fusion had two fusions. One was uh, 4, 5, and 13. One was at 5, 1, or L5, S1, and 15. Um, had referral of symptoms into both legs. Here, uh, balance deficits, so this goes back to um, as soon as they say balance problems, I always, you know, have them walk a straight line. And I even tell the patients, if, you're, if we're worried or watching for a spinal cord issue, I want you to walk a straight line every day at home. And if you've noticed that you can't do it or it's getting worse, then you need to call me. Um, uh, and some on exam looked diffuse hyperreflexic. So, Keep in mind, this person came in, this guy came in with low back pain and leg symptoms, but then you look further and he had some hyperreflexity. This is his MRI. So, um, has uh, some stenosis at two levels there, um, but is this really the problem? Probably not. So, this is a cervical MRI and um, you can uh, see where it gets really narrow down the middle, and there's a little white spot in the spinal cord. That's really his problem. So uh, he has compression of the cervical cord, and it's really coming from the neck and not so not coming from the low back. So this is just where the uh, a good indication where the um, physical exam can really turn things around. I think the next two are just kind of interesting cases that I had. Um, this is a 29-year-old gentleman, again, referred for low back pain. He had an event that uh, you could um, account for his back pain, was moving a couch, um, had back pain with numbness into the lower limbs, left greater than right. Had been going on for a few months. Um, the, uh, the primary care uh, gave him some prednisone. It got better to some degree, it came back. The pain got better, but the numbness continued. Um, did physical therapy did not change the numbness in his legs. <clears throat> um, strength and reflex is normal, non-localizing decreased sensation in the lower limbs, EMG was normal. Um, and then he called one day and said, wanted to follow up, he had, the numbness was getting worse and he had perineal numbness. He said, um, and he was getting some bowel or bladder symptoms. So MRI of the lumbar spine was relatively unremarkable. Um, and that was done earlier on actually. And it just didn't make sense. Something wasn't right. And so we did more imaging and he had multiple areas of abnormality in the cord in the thoracic and cervical spine, any diagnosis was MS. So that was just, a, again, one of those things, if things just don't quite make sense, then you gotta look further. And um, that's, uh, last time I heard he was doing okay. Now this is a, a perfect case for an indication of 
um, overutilizing the medical system. And this, I, I think I use this in every talk because I think it horrifies me. Um, and I still see this guy, a uh, 72-year-old gentleman, went to the emergency room with complaints of severe left hip and thigh pain. Granted, this was not a COPC primary care at the time. This was a gentleman who went to OSU emergency room, no trauma, um, and admitted for workup and pain management. So he had an x-ray of the hip, showed some arthritis, <clears throat> had an inpatient orthopedic consult, diagnosed with bursitis and iliotibial band syndrome, and given an injection. Granted, he's still in the hospital. So he's now hospitalized for IT band syndrome and bursitis, stayed in the hospital for three days, discharged, actually, and this isn't right, because um, he was discharged to a rehab facility for rehab, then went home in physical therapy and payments. So this guy, with a working diagnosis of bursitis and ITBN, was in the hospital for three days and rehab. So then I saw him because he was still having pain. So I saw him, um, it was about two weeks after he had gotten out, he was not getting better, left buttock pain, lateral hip, anterior thigh, didn't go below the knee. <clears throat> Did not have numbness and tingling, but he said, I, I kind of get this burning in my thigh. Um, Pain was, pain was standing greater than sitting. He wasn't sleeping. Um, walked with a cane, strength largely intact except maybe some weakness in the hip flexion. Reflexes, uh, absent reflexes in the ankles. He was 70 something, I think maybe he was a diabetic, um, but diminished reflexes really isn't unusual in the older population. Um, and only mildly positive favor. And I still like this is doesn't make sense. Did an MRI. He had a large L3-4 uh, herniation, foraminal stenosis. Went to the surgeon. Did a minimally invasive procedure, and um, is doing awesome to this day. This was probably three years ago. Um, so, granted, he ended up with the surgery. It was an outpatient surgery, uh, which was a lot cheaper than three-day hospital stay and two weeks in rehab. <laughs> So um, I, it still baffles me that with the working diagnosis, granted he belonged in the hospital probably because he had a big disc herniation, but the working diagnosis at the time was uh, bursitis. But all right, I think that is the end of mine. And I think we'll take questions at the end, right? Yeah, I don't have any questions in okay. the... So I think if you hit... Um, Escape. Escape. Yep, and then you can just close that window. Yep, and then whoever's going next can pull theirs up from. Yep, you got it. So um, I'm uh, Jackie McGowan and all my medical stuff says Jacqueline so that like if I ever get a call and they say Jacqueline, I know it, that they don't know me personally. So if you ever have a question, um, just feel free to call me Jackie or if you have a um, patient, just call me Jackie. But that's more just so I know people who um, know me from which part of my life. But um, I'm newer to um, COPC. I've been here now for about a year, and I'm the only PM&R uh, doc of our PM&R docs who does not do any spinal interventions. Um, I am trained in general PM&R, and then I did a um, primary care sports medicine fellowship. So I did not do an interventional pain um, or spine fellowship. So I'm a little bit different, um, and I am a little bit of a hybrid between the two practices. I work in the orthopedic urgent care. Um, I've been kind of uh, bobbing and weaving a little bit with a lot of changes with um, uh, 
uh, Dr. Fossilman being out of the office, so my schedule's changed, but I am currently, um, as of this week, is my last day working the urgent care Monday nights and Wednesday during the day. Starting next week, I will be in the um, uh, OUC for all day Wednesday, 9 to 8. Um, and then I have regular clinic at um, a new location for us that, again, it's been there for a year, but I found out from one primary care doc that they didn't know that we were there for a while. So if one didn't know we were there for a while, I'm sure there's others who don't know that we are over in um, the Upper Arlington-ish area on um, Knightsbridge. So I'm there two, two days a week. And um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, my background, I came from Mount Carmel. I was there doing sports medicine for four years. Um, our department got eliminated because of COVID and I was very happy to land here at COPC. Um, and I'm the team physician for Westerville South High School and have been so since 2013. That's a little bit of my background. So, so I'm supposed to hit presentation mode. It's one of those that cools down. Is it this one? Yes. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk about the orthopedic urgent care um, today. And okay. So here are the locations for COPC um, sports spine and joint. Um, we have up here is the Stella practice. That is just rheumatology. Um, and then our main location here, we call it the mothership is right off of um, uh, Cleveland Avenue, and that's where the orthopedic urgent care is located. Um, this is where I am on Mondays and Tuesdays, and I do see more than backs, I do peripheral joints, so if you have something that you think needs to see um, uh, sports med but doesn't necessarily need to go to the urgent care, I'm happy to see them, and um, you can get in with me that usually that, that week there, I think Tuesday next week, I have like six patients, but um, so we're usually able to add people there um, pretty easily. Um, Dr. Pulver is at Knightsbridge, uh, one, or not Knightsbridge, sorry, um, five points once a week. And then we also have locations down in um, Canal, which Dr. Skeels and Dr. Grombach both go there. And um, Dr. Skeels also goes to, um, uh, Reynoldsburg as well. So we have several locations across the city. Um, I don't know, Dr. Steele's can tell you his schedule. I don't know what all days he's where um, when he comes up and presents next. So um, our hours for the OUC are going to be changing. Um, as I mentioned um, earlier, Dr. Fosterman was out for a little bit. He is back as of tomorrow and we are so thankful to have him back. Um, but he's going to start working in the um, orthopedic urgent care Friday evenings until six. So that's a new change. Before it was only open until four. Um, so now it's gonna be open until six. And then Monday through Thursday, we are open eight to eight. Um, and here are all of our providers. Um, Dr. Davis is full time in the orthopedic urgent care. Um, he does not work Wednesdays, but he's there Monday. He works a 12 hour shift on Tuesday, and then he's there Thursday, Friday. Um, Dr. Fossilman. Um, is going to be there, I believe, Monday nights, Tuesday during the day, and then Friday um, afternoon, evenings. Um, I'm going to be working um, the 12 hour on Wednesday. And then uh, Dr. Kitchen works a swing shift on um, Mondays and is going to be uh, staying on in, on Wednesdays. We do have two PAs who also cover the orthopedic urgent care. And that's really just because so we can have accessibility um, and our um, PAs are great. They work and um, have experience in working in orthopedic urgent cares and um, Sharmi was also a PT. So they have really extensive background in musculoskeletal care. And if a patient comes into the orthopedic urgent care and sees a PA first, I know sometimes um, we as physicians are, we like to, for our patients to see other physicians. But um, like I said, they're very well trained, but also um, the follow-up appointment would be with a physician. But this is a way, again, that we can increase access um, and have the hours that we do in the urgent care. Um, but again, they're, they're excellent and 
Um, I know Sharmi has my cell phone number and has reached out to me um, before with questions and um, reaches out to the other physicians too. So um, that's a little bit about just kind of scheduling. Um, so what do we see in the orthopedic urgent care? Um, so we see uh, orthopedic stuff, obviously, um, sports medicine, fractures, strains, sprains. We do see walk-ins, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the schedule too. Um, we're trying to limit those to COPC patients instead of just um, anybody walking in off the street so that we are um, uh, providing access again to our patients. Um, we can see um, acute injuries, contusions, acute exacerbations of chronic issues, um, as well as rechecks of our own patients. Um, and I'll show you, um, not the next slide, but the slide after, we'll show what our schedule looks like, and um, I'll discuss that a little bit, a little bit more. Um, but, so we can see um, like all of these, like I said, but we have DME uh, supplies. We have braces, we have um, crutches, we have um, knee immobilizers, we have materials for casting and splinting. Um, so we can do a lot of stuff um, in uh, the orthopedic urgent care and save patients from having to go to the uh, emergency room. Um, so things that we don't see in the orthopedic urgent care. So abscess drain, drainage, abdominal trauma, um, the polytrauma, pediatric congenital abnormalities, patients requiring um, ambulance transport, chronic issues. So somebody who's been having back pain for 10 months and um, nothing's really changed, that's not really a patient that would be appropriate for the orthopedic urgent care. That would be somebody that would be more appropriate for um, just a referral for the PM&R clinic. Um, but if they're having an acute exacerbation, say they've been having pain for, for 10 months and now all of a sudden it's worse and they're having um, radiating pain down the leg, they're having paresthesias or they're having a foot drop that's new, that is definitely something that's appropriate for the orthopedic urgent care. Again, we will see whatever comes in the door we will manage the patient, but from a triage standpoint, um, the more patients that we have that are taking up slots for those chronic conditions, the less we're able to get in for the acute conditions um, that we could avoid ER trips for. So just something to kind of um, keep in mind. And, you know, if there's any questions about a patient, whether, whether we see it or not, I know any of us, we're available, Doc Halo, you can send us um, a message through the um, a telephone encounter. Doc Halo is probably one of the best ways to at least communicate with me. Um, and just say, hey, I have a question. You can call, you can even call the office and say, is this appropriate or not? There's many times where I'll get a Doc Halo. Hey, I have this patient. This is, um, I think there's a fracture. There's this x-ray. Can you take a look? Is this something you can treat or not? And that's perfectly appropriate. Um, and so, I like having communication with the with the other um, other physicians. I mean, I I'm new. I came in during COVID, so I don't know everybody. Um, I don't. I know very few. So it's nice to actually have those interactions. Um, but here's the other list here: um, post-op or post-procedural complications, medication refills, or um, second opinions. So uh, not really appropriate. I have had that happen. That was not from one of our physicians. It was somehow our staff um, at CSSJ put one on my schedule of somebody who had seen seven other physicians in every specialty and didn't have an answer and was in the orthopedic urgent care with me trying to find out the answer. Um, so that's, we even have training on our end. We have the same, um, we've had a lot of uh, new staff and so a lot of training going on. So that's even something that, that we're working on as well. Um, but um, here's the um, OUC volume um, in case uh, you're in, interested at all in the, the numbers of patients that we see. And from April of um, 18 all the way to July of um, this year, you can see um, that generally speaking, other than, you know, COVID uh, has progressively increased. And so this is, we're keeping people out of 
the ER. Um, and so this is where we bring value to the system and really managing these, these patients. Um, we try and uh, keep image costs down, um, image when, when needed, but not over imaging. Same thing with medications. Um, there are times where we do have to transfer patients, but uh, to the ER, but those are, um, those are, uh, I would say for me anyway, few and far between. Usually if I'm doing it, it's because the ones that I've sent have been because I was concerned of a DVT and the same day center um, didn't have um, a um, ultrasound tech available. Um, and obviously that's not something I would wanna sit on. Um, but so scheduling, this is something that people always wanna know, how do you schedule um, for the orthopedic urgent care? And you guys can schedule on your, um, your offices can schedule on the orthopedic urgent care under the resource schedule. I think it says orthopedic um, urgent care resource schedule. And this is what it looks like. And so just to kind of go over this with you, um, like I said, we have grown. Obviously I'm new in the last year and I started working in the urgent care in February of last of this, what, what year is it? I don't even know, 21. So February 21 is when I started working in the urgent care. Uh, we brought on Dr. Kitchen as well. And so we now have times where we have double coverage. But when you're looking at the schedule, what you can see here is like on Monday from eight to nine, when there's a consult, then a hold, consult, hold, we are concurrently running a follow-up clinic at the same time as we're running the orthopedic urgent care. And so when, we, when you see this on the schedule, that means that there's one physician that is actually working the orthopedic urgent care at that time. And these hold slots are slots where they have a follow-up appointment. Um, when all of these are open, that's where there's two physicians working that day. So, and we trade off every other um, patient so that again, we can have that um, continuity clinic for, for our follow-up patients um, as well. And we've talked about um, uh, toying with this schedule a little bit, and we're definitely open to um, any suggestions that people might have in terms of running this a little bit um, differently, but um, this is what we have currently. Um, and so these hold slots, sometimes there aren't patients there. What we, what we do ask is that if you look and all of these slots are full and you see these hold slots, um, please call the office um, or send a doc halo to see if the, those, avail, those spots are open instead of just putting somebody on or saying, oh, hey, uh, it looks like the schedule is full, but just walk in over there. They'll squeeze you in. Sometimes you could just give us a call and then we can say, you know what, this is full, but it looks like, um, you know, Dr. Pulver has, has an opening. We can ship things around and maybe tell this patient to come at this time. Um, maybe it's three o'clock in the afternoon instead of sending them over at 1145. That saves us from trying to scramble with a walk-in um, and also keeps the patient from having to wait there for several hours. So um, that those are ways for scheduling that, that would be really um, helpful. Again, if you see these hold slots, um, we understand we wanna get people in. And if there's somebody who needs to be seen, please just message us, we will make it work, we'll make it happen. But it does flow a little bit easier if we know somebody's coming ahead of time um, too. So that's kind of um, the overview of what the schedule looks like. Um, so I'm gonna go into a case that I saw, and this is more of a, um, just kind of a, dis it's not really a discussion because nobody's here to discuss with me right now, um, other than you virtually, but um, this is not meant for um, any criticizing. This is all learning points, things that, that we all can learn. Um, I learned from this case myself. So I had a patient come in to the orthopedic urgent care for um, electronombersitis. And he was seen in the same day center and they said, oh, you have electronombersitis. This is not the patient. This is just a Google image that I found. Um, and uh, they said, it looks to be infected. Go uh, send them to the orthopedic urgent care to get it drained. So I saw him. It was definitely, it was about this size. It was definitely red, it was hot. 
history was that it had spontaneously opened, had drained a little bit, and then closed back up, and then that's when it became warm, hot, red. So he comes in, um, I said, definitely this is olecranombersitis. It looks infected. Um, I discussed risks and benefits of aspirating this. Um, so I aspirated, I think it was about 10, I think it was like 10 um, cc's of cloudy fluid out of it. Um, I did use an 18 gauge needle, so that does leave um, you know, a, a decent size opening, um, so it would continue to drain. Um, and I sent the, the cultures off for, or I sent the, the fluid off for culture and started them on Bactrim um, to cover community um, acquired MRSA. So um, I placed a compression bandage and planned to follow up with him in a week to make sure he was um, progressing. Um, I did not hear back from the patient. Um, I kept checking labs and the prelim came back as um, uh, positive staff or positive gram, sorry, I'm not a uh, antibiotic um, person, but um, it's gram positive cocci and clusters, that's staph, right? That's what that looks like, I believe. <laughs> Is that correct? Anyway, it came out to be staph, but we were waiting for sensitivities and culture. Um, so two days later, the patient showed up at the primary care's office. He was having decreased range of motion um, in the elbow. He was noted draining from the bursa. He was having some nausea symptoms and his vital signs were stable. Um, the primary care physician was worried with his nausea, his decreased range of motion, and the elbow that he was developing um, a septic joint and could be septic. Um, so he was sent to the ER where um, he ortho was consulted. He was given IV vancomycin. He was admitted for observation. Um, ortho determined it wasn't surgical and they discharged him on clindamycin and Keflex, and they discontinued Bactrim. Now, I don't know what's typical for our um, culture results. He was supposed to follow up with me again that uh, week later, and so I'm looking for the results. I don't have the, um, the results back for the um, uh, sensitivities. So I called the lab, asked for them. They came back later that day. Um, that it was susceptible to Bactrim and resistant to clindamycin. So he did not show up for his appointment with me. He saw his primary care who ended up discontinuing the clinda, put him on an anti-inflammatory and restarted Bactrim. So some learning points from this case are one, um, that we do have the ECC, which could have given him IV bank. His vital signs were stable so he did not, was not septic at that time. In the uh, ER, his vitals were stable. Um, so this is something where uh, an ER trip could have been avoided. Um, we could have um, uh, coordinated that with ECC, got him in for IV vancomycin. Um, olecranon um, bursitis is, infected olecranon bursitis is an outpatient surgery. Um, Bactrim being on an antibiotic could cause nausea as well. So these are just some different learning points and things to kind of take away and think about. Um, I know we have so many programs uh, within COPC that, and in the heat of it, and when you're seeing this patient that can't move their elbow and they're in pain, that it can be easy to kind of get into that, oh my gosh, this is something bad. We got to get it taken care of now and, you know, kind of fast track it when maybe if we step back and think about what we do have available for patients, this could have saved um, an observation stay. Um, but those are just, again, some thoughts. Again, we're all, we're all learning. Um, we're all having these uh, new programs coming out. And so trying to keep abreast of, of what we do have available for our patients um, uh, is important. So I didn't realize that we had the ECC that could do vancomycin. Um, and I was talking to one of my partners about it. 
And that's when they said, hey, yeah, they could have gone here, could have gone to Ivy Bank, and then then they would have avoided the hospitalization altogether, and then we could have gotten them in for to uh, orthopedics for uh, consult the next day. Um, so I have great relationships with several uh, orthopedic uh, surgeons in town, and they know if I'm sending them a patient that they need to be seen, and usually they squeeze them in really quickly. So um, just some uh, some learning points there. Um, so they also wanted uh, me to touch on some common um, complaints seen in the orthopedic urgent care. Um, I don't know if I'll have time to go through both of these because we're done at what time? Seven. Um, we, we're we can go a little long. Okay. To. Okay. So um, shoulder pain and knee pain. Those are very common things that we see. I chose to start talking about shoulder pain um, because I feel like uh, the knee gets a lot of attention. And I know Dr. Skills is going to talk a little bit about joint replacements too, so he'll talk a little bit about um, knees as well. But um, just kind of some quick tips and pearls about shoulder pain. Um, so differential diagnosis when anybody comes in uh, with shoulder pain, is it really shoulder or is it neck? So I always look at both. Um, I check range of motion of cervical spine and shoulder. I ask, okay, does your pain get worse with shoulder movement? Does it get worse with, um, sorry, did the backwards with shoulder movement or neck movement? Um, and I check all ranges, so flexion, extension, lateral flexion, lateral rotation. For the shoulder, you're looking for um, flexion, you're looking for abduction, external rotation and internal rotation and compare it side to side. And just some like quick tips are if um, the shoulder exam is limited, is it limited with active, passive or both? So if they are limited with active range of motion, but you can move them passively, then you start thinking of impingement, rotator cuff, AC pathology, or if there's trauma involved, fracture. If the patient can't, I always tell my patients, if you can't move you and I can't move you, then that's a sign of either arthritis or adhesive capsulitis. That would be a case in the orthopedic urgent care where I would get an x-ray because if the x-ray is normal, I can't move them, they can't move themselves, then that's adhesive capsulitis if the x-ray is normal. Um, if there's, you know, a a big osteophyte there, well, then it's, it's osteoarthritis, and the treatment can be different depending treatment as well as expectations in terms of uh, recovery. So that is something that I will definitely x-ray. Um, but the one thing, too, with when you're checking passive range of motion is try and get them to relax. I say it 100 times a day. Just relax, relax, and try and see if you can get them to not guard. Sometimes it can be difficult, but these are just kind of um, some, some quick tips. If they can't move themselves, but you can move them, you're not looking at um, adhesive capsulitis or severe arthritis. Um, so then I palpate, and I palpate the cervical um, spinous processes. I palpate the paraspinals, the um, trapezius. I palpate along the scapular border. Um, I palpate across the um, uh, subacromial bursa, the AC joint across the clavicle, the SC joint. Um, and then I check strength. So again, my shoulder and neck, if somebody comes in to see me for neck pain, I'm basically doing my entire shoulder exam. If they're coming in with shoulder pain, I'm basically doing what I would do for neck as well as shoulder. So I'm, I'm making sure I'm checking all the myotomes. Um, I'm checking all sensation. I'm checking reflexes, I'm checking for spurlings. And then um, with special tests, so I was gonna have um, Fran come up so I could demonstrate these uh, special tests for you because uh, one thing with uh, orthopedics is that um, they really like to put their names on tests and then they don't really mean anything, but they're just these random names. So um, two tests, the first two are for impingement, Mears and Hawkins. These are both passive tests, and patients really like to be, I should put my mask on, sorry. 
Patients like to be good patients and they like to try and help you, but this is a passive test. So for nears, I always think near to the ear. So you internally rotate the patient and then you bring the arm up near their ear and you bring them all the way up. And if that causes pain, that's a positive sign of impingement. For Hawking's, I had one of my senior residents in um, residency, I'll never forget it. She's like, Hawkins, like a hawk. And she go, caw, caw, caw. <laughs> so there, now you go, now you guys have that. Um, so you bring them up to 90 degrees um, of shoulder flexion, elbow bent 90 degrees, and then you, you passively internally rotate. And I usually go in several planes to see if that causes any pain. And what you're doing is you're just kind of cranking that humeral head up against that bursa and pinching it up against that AC joint. So that's Hawkins. And then cross arm, once I have them here, I just have them reach across, like they're giving themselves a hug, and that's compressing the AC joint. Um, and then for O'Brien's, it's coming across, thumb pointed down, it's about 10 degrees coming across. I do have these on the next slide in case you guys aren't watching me. Um, and then I have them resist, so don't let me push you down. Okay? Good. And then see if that causes pain. And then thumb up and hold and see if that causes pain. If they don't have pain with thumb up, that's um, a positive sign and it's a, that's a test for labral pathology. Um, empty can, which is rotator cuff, is you want the, um, the arm in the same plane as the scapula and you just check strength here. Um, and that is testing the supraspinatus muscle. So thank you. Uh, so those are uh, tests for um, shoulder imaging. If there's trauma, it would image. If there's any neurological deficits, um, that's when I would consider doing imaging. And um, typically, if there's neurological deficits, it's coming from the neck. So I would probably focus my imaging there. Um, and then if, if this is, if they can't resist me at all, um, on empty can or I'm checking external rotation and their arm is just going in, they can't give me anything, and I know I'm going to need to get an MRI because of a, a rotator cuff tear, then I will um, get an x-ray because I'm not going to get that MRI approved without an x-ray. Um, so those are uh, the shoulder pain pearls. Um, I can talk about knee pain briefly or we can just exit and go to Dr. Skeels. We'll probably try and keep on Okay. Let Dr. Skeels jump in. All right. Do you want me to say the question for the end? Um, that question I'm going to, uh, I'll need for the people that are doing this remotely later on. Got so. it. So I will just exit. Thank you. Yep. So we can just pop out of that one. Oh, it's escape. it up at the top where uh, uh, way up at the top nope up even higher ah there it is there you go all right perfect all right so i'm mike skills i've um i've been here about or been with sue pc for it'll be two years here in december i uh, was with orthonor previously and jumped over here in 2019. Um, Jackie mentioned kind of we're all over the place a little bit. I do see patients in uh, both Reynoldsburg and Canal Winchester just to kind of increase the footprint. Uh, so Canal Winchester on Wednesdays, uh, Court is there on Mondays, and then uh, I'm in Reynoldsburg on Thursdays. So if you're on that side of town, um, you need referrals for being musculoskeletal, spine, uh, we're there to help uh, with anything you need. So today we're going to talk about uh, joint replacements. Um, and so obviously degenerative joint disease, we've all seen it. 
um, common, one of the most common things uh, we see in the office. Um, repetitive motion, there's both inflammation, there's both um, inflammation and structural damage, so both mechanical and um, biologic. What we see, um, we lose that articular cartilage. Uh, as we get older, more than 50% of people um, over the age of 65 have some sort of degenerative joint disease. Um, up until 55, it's equal males and females, and then uh, um, after 55, we see more in females. And then the most commonly seen in the hands, hips, and knees. Um, risk factors, obviously repetitive motion, infection, rheumatoid, trauma, uh, muscular dystrophy, osteoporosis, hormone disorders, uh, obesity, sickle cell, and bone disorders. And um, I'll stop on obesity here for a second. One thing we're learning, we're learning more, obesity traditionally is thought to be just mechanical. Increased weight, increased pressure on the joint, that's, that is very true. Uh, but one thing, there's uh, newer research is showing that the adipose cells increase the inflammatory markers. Inflammatory markers find the way in the joints, uh, increase inflammation in the joint, increase cartilage loss, joint space narrowing, increase arthritis. So obesity is not just a mechanical um, issue or a mechanical cause. It's also a biological cause. Um, so evaluation, so look at these patients, I mean, history is always key in everything we do, uh, so what you'll see commonly, pain, stiffness, weakness, whether it's the wrist, the thumb, the, the knee, the hip, ankle, um, and then physical exam, I mean, I'm always looking at range of motion, looking at joint structure, uh, especially when they stand, looking at the knees, varus valgus. Uh, angulation, um, tenderness, uh, strength, and then walking. Walking is something I love, um, watching patients. One of the great things in our office, we kind of have a central area, and then the patients, uh, at least where I see patients, have to walk by uh, to go to the rooms. You can learn a lot by watching someone walk. Um, caught numerous things just watching someone walk when they didn't even come in for it. Um, cerebral myelopathy, hip, um, hip arthritis, things like that, that just you can pick up on, on watching someone walk. So that, I think that's a physical exam finding that kind of gets overlooked a lot. Um, so I just encourage people to take advantage of, try and see your patients walk um, if you're looking at them for musculoskeletal diseases. Uh, imaging, our uh, x-rays are uh, paramount. Um, so, and we're looking at uh, uh, CTs and MRIs as well. Uh, but x-rays are obviously very important. Um, so, knee arthritis, let's, let's talk about knees first. Um, among adults uh, 60, uh, 60 years older, 10% in men, 13% women. Um, the increase in prevalence, uh, uh, osteoarthritis will have a growing impact on health care in the United States, and that uh, uh, obviously affects us as focusing on uh, community health and value-based care. Uh, treatments, uh, the way I look at this and uh, what I tell my patients, it's almost like a buffet. Um, one of the good things about this is this is not a life-saving uh, procedure, or these are not, this is not a life also, uh, this is not a disease where, I mean, uh, almost, this is not a fatal disease. So we can do, I tell patients, we can do a little bit, we can do a lot. Kind of depends on where you are with this, how much pain you're having, how much this is affecting your function. And I always try and start minimally evasive and, and work our way down. Um, activity modification, that's, I mean, trying to stay away from some of those Aggravating activities, I know it's hard for, I mean, some of our patients, they're in their 70s, they don't want to stop doing certain things, and I never like telling people to stop being active. Um, so a lot of it's trying to find ways where they can do certain activities um, while also um, trying not to aggravate uh, the joint. So 
acupuncture, again, it's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't seek that out to cure cancer, but for something like this, I've had patients where it works. Uh, weight loss, uh, we'll talk about that more uh, in a little bit, but I mean, weight loss is important. Uh, bracing, uh, which can help. There's medial and loader braces. There's uh, different types of braces that can help with the pain. Uh, physical therapy, I'm a big fan of physical therapy. That just kind of gets patients moving. Uh, helps almost, it's not exercise, but almost uh, acts as exercise. Um, work on strengthening, especially in the knee. Strengthening the knee, it's great. And, and, it, and if they do have bad arthritis and you know they're 70 and they're gonna live 20 more years, it's better to have that knee stronger if they, when they do have a knee replacement. Uh, recovery is easier. Uh, acetaminophen, of course, NSAIDs, both oral and topical, uh, supple, different supplements, uh, injections. Uh, we've got steroids. We've got visco supplementation like Euflexa, Synvisc, basically the hyaluronic acids, uh, PRP stem cells, and then genicular uh, nerve blocks and radiofrequency ablation. And then at the end of this is a partial or total uh, knee. So what I tell patients is regarding exercise is do what you can, whether it's swimming. Some patients can swim, some patients, it hurts their back to swim, or biking, walking, I don't care. I just want, I just want you moving. Because um, it only helps your recovery. Say if, we, if the end stage is a, a joint replacement, the better condition you are going into it, the better your outcome is after. Um, studies have shown that it's clear. So to give the patients a better chance of success, I tell them, let's do it now. Let's not wait till after, I mean, one year, two years, five years down the road when you do get a knee replacement. Uh, physical therapy, uh, the keys there are strengthening balance, uh, like we talked about. Um, aerobic exercise, strengthening, uh, the different neuromuscular training where we're, we're looking at weakness and the sensory motor control and the instability. Uh, Water-based therapy, it's, it's very good. Uh, obviously, we're taking the pressure off the joint. And then uh, yoga and Tai Chi. So another treatment option is knee bracing. Um, medial and lower braces, uh, they can be very effective. It's basically where you, the, the brace is putting pressure and taking uh, uh, some of the the pressure off the inside part of the knee. Medial, medial and loaders, I think, work better than some of the other ones. Um, and, and also medial osteoarthritis is more common. So uh, that's something that I've had patients use when, when they're golfing, um, and it just allows them to continue to be active, which function to me is so important. Keeping, keeping our patients moving uh, only helps their uh, quality of life and helps their uh, overall health. Uh, there's also patellofemoral brace and kinesio taping. These all can can be used as non-surgical options. NSAIDs, um, so they have they have shown uh, benefit short-term relief. Um, topical, it, it can, topical does help with the knee arthritis or does help with the symptoms of the knee arthritis and then oral. Uh, supplements, a lot of a lot of patients like the supplements. There's not great data to support this. Um, I, but my approach to it is, hey, I mean, try it. The worst, typically, the worst that's, that's going to happen is it's going to lighten your pocketbook a little bit because some of these supplements are not cheap. Uh, but the the way I approach it is, there's no harm in trying this stuff, and if it works, great. And I've had patients who take turmeric and they swear by it; and it's amazing. And other patients who who take it and it's a complete waste. And same thing with glucosamine capsaicin is is something we're starting to see a little bit more and uh, there's more research and data coming out about capsaicin and, and I think that there is something there um, uh, to help with pain. Uh, injections, so uh, injections have been shown to help with short-term relief. Uh, there. So what we're looking at is up to six months. And, and there is data that shows um, both with intraarticular steroid and the hyaluronic acid or the visco supplementation injections that they do help with um, pain, the pain scores decrease, knee function increases, and range of motion increases at six months. Is this a long-term option? No. Uh, but it is something that can help short-term. Uh, weight loss. 
So weight loss is important uh, for many factors. Um, one thing we do see is even just a 5% loss in body weight can be associated with, associated with changes in both clinical and um, mechanical outcomes. And then the benefits continue to increase with uh, increased weight loss. So I think it's something it's something I try to bring up with the patients, um, and because uh, it affects them before and after uh, a total joint. Um, and this is what we see with obesity and uh, total knee. Um, and there's one of the challenges is there's there's very good surgeons in town who will not do knee replacements. And I'm sure you guys have seen this when a surgeon sends a patient back says they need to lose, they need to get their BMI under 40. Um, and I kind of, I see both sides of it. Um, the, the, from the surgeon's perspective and their point is, is and the data is clear, it shows it, people with a BMI over 40 have a higher rate of complication, higher rate of infection, longer hospital stay, um, higher revision rate, higher rate of DVT, higher rate of fatalities. Um, and from their standpoint is why am I going to take my patient and put them in harm's way when we know someone who has a BMI over 40 has higher risk of these complications. Let's get their BMI under 40 and then we'll do the surgery. It's not that simple. So, um, uh, trying to address this, and, and I don't know what the right answer is, really, because um, there's people who are suffering and they have bad joints, and um, but there's surgeons who won't operate them. There are some other surgeons in town who will do that, um, but my concern is, is what if we get to the point where uh, a lot of the top surgeons, they cherry pick, won't do, because obviously these are patients who are harder to operate on, higher complication rate, takes more time. Uh, I would hope we never get to the point where um, the, the top surgeons are choosing only pe people with BMIs under 40, and that's left to the surgeons who are not as skilled in, in the community. What would that look like? So obviously, we don't have that scenario, and that's just um, speculation, but in 10 years, what if, what if something happened like that? Um, one thing we do know, talking about weight loss, um, well, talking about obesity, people who people are obese, they have uh, they'll have a total joint at a younger age, so they're getting it earlier, so they have to live with it longer, um, increased complications as we've talked about, and increased cost, increased discharges to SNF and things like that, uh, which as population health, uh, this is something that I mean we're looking at. One interesting fact, or one, or multiple studies have also shown this that, and we hear, I hear this from patients all the time. Once I get my knee fixed or my hip fixed or whatever, then I'm going to lose the weight. The data doesn't bear that out. <laughs> Most patients, I think 70% was one study I saw. 70% patients do not um, lose weight. Or 70% of obese patients do not lose weight after a total joint. And one group of patients that did lose weight was the older group. And so was that just general deconditioning, being older? So um, it doesn't bear out that, yes, you'll, once you get your total joint, then you're going to lose, and then you're going to lose all the weight. The, the data just doesn't support that. So I try and convince patients, let's do what we can, let's do it now, and address and it. It's a hard com conversation. Um, so with knees, we've got the partial knee and total knee. Both are very effective. Both are very successful. Uh, partial knee obviously is is less invasive. So typically those patients do do better. But yeah, but they do they do end up a lot of them do end up having a total knee or needing a total requiring a total knee five, seven, fifteen years down the road. Uh, but generally, patients do very well with this surgery, and that's one of the great things about um, what I tell patients about total joints is. It is a very successful surgery. Um, looking at patient satisfaction versus um, surgical uh, satisfaction, patient satisfaction rates are lower than, than um, surgeon success. Um, when you, you can read all, all the, um, the data that shows 
95% at 10 years, 95% at 15 years, which that's 95% are still in and functioning. Um, but that doesn't mean the patients are happy. But in general, patients are very happy. So it, at 12 months, I mean, 90% people are satisfied. And that's generally what we see. Um, next is the hip. So uh, very common as well, uh, almost 10% in adults 45 or older. Again, men before 50, um, higher incidence, and after that, then women catch up and pass the men. Um, treatment options, what we, a lot of these are repeats of what we address with the knee. Um, just getting patients moving, active, active uh, the NSAIDs, steroids, and then surgery. Um, weight loss, again, um, trying not to beat <laughs> beat on this, but it, it is relevant. Um, exercise does help with pain reduction. I mean, low impact, yoga, cycling, um, physical therapy actually is, is beneficial in early hip arthritis, but not, uh, not late. And then weight loss, uh, 10 pounds can, losing 10 pounds, or, or excuse me, gaining 10 pounds can exert an extra 60 pounds of pressure on the hip. Uh, so, me and I tell patients every pound counts and it, it's a slow grind. Um, Anti-inflammatory medications treatment, so topical, no benefit with the hip, but oral, of course, still shows a short-term benefit. Supplements, just as we saw before, um, there's no, not great evidence, but the way I look at it, uh, a lot of this stuff, there's no harm in, uh, no harm in trying it. Uh, for hip injections, so similar to what we saw on the knee, sh good short-term relief, uh, no evidence of long-term relief, and then uh, the hyaluronic acid or visco supplementation is not indicated or approved for hips, so not, it's never been shown to really help with the hip arthritis. Um, total hips, uh, there has been an increase, so we're gonna be seeing more and more of these, um, and they're estimating 570,000 at, uh, in 2030, um, again, great numbers, 95% at 10 years, 93% patients are very satisfied or highly satisfied. Um, now moving on to the shoulder, we have, uh, so about 16 to 20% of adults over 65 have radiographic evidence of uh, osteoarthritis. Uh, glenohumeral is the uh, third most common large joint to be affected uh, behind the hips and knees. And then risk factors, female, Caucasian, obesity. Treatment options, uh, we've, we've talked about these uh, very similar uh, to the uh, hips and the knees. Um, physical therapy, I think therapy is, is important in the shoulder. Um, early, late, uh, the whole goal is just to keep the strength of the arm or the shoulder, keep the keep the shoulder strength, keep the motion. So it's part of a, a multimodal treatment plan. And, and again, it's all about increasing their function. Um, NSAID, so topical again, not, not really beneficial with shoulder arthritis, but orals do show short-term relief. Supplements, not great data. Um, injections, so evidence again for injection, short-term relief, it doesn't last forever. Um, one thing that's interesting is uh, the hyaluronic acid, the gel injections, uh, they actually are effective, or, or some of the data does show they are effective for shoulder arthritis, but it is not approved in the uh, United States. It, it, is, it is approved and, and used in Europe. So unfortunately, for I don't know what the uh, regulatory reasons why they're not approved here, but it's not. Um, and then end stage total shoulder arthroplasty uh, becoming much more common. Um, I mean, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, you were hardly doing these, and, and patients' function wasn't. It was more for pain relief and function. They were, the goal was just to hopefully the patients were able to get their uh, hand up to their head for self-care, but that's changing. Um, patients are, are doing better, the prosthesis are doing better, they're lasting longer. Um, reverse total shoulders are also um, 
being used more when appropriately. It's they uh, that's typically indicated with uh, almost complete or severe rotator cuff deficiency. Uh, in both these, both to both traditional short arthroplasty and uh, reverse have shown an improvement in pain and function. Um, one other thing, just or a couple other things, is um, one thing I think it's important when when patients do end up uh, seeing a surgeon. Sur surgeon selection is important. One, there's studies that do show that the more joints you do, the better your outcomes are. So, um, I always encourage patients to let's find someone who. And I've got patients or surgeons that we refer to who do a lot of these, um, and that's what you want. I'd rather have the surgeon who does 500, 700 of these a year versus someone who does 15 a year. Uh, so I think that's important to look at. Um, and the other thing I like to do, I just want to kind of give a shout out for the nutrition counseling that we have here now. Um, I try, my goal is to use it on a patient every week because um, Obviously, we're seeing patients who are overweight, and as you heard from this talk, I think uh, weight loss is, is really uh, important in just the overall health. Uh, so I try and use it. Um, I've only had one patient who's refused, um, and I've had patients come back and said they're happy and they had a great conversation, and it's something we now offer through the uh, MSK program, and you can just go under referrals, and it's COPC, COPCP, and then under that, it's uh, nutrition counseling. So just a little plug out for them, and uh, that'll be it. Um, we do have one question in the chat. It was actually the chat question that I had as well. Okay. Um, comment on uh, PRP and stem cells. So data is is confounding. It's not great. So there is some, some data that does show it helps in early stages. Late stage, it does not help. So we're still learning about this. We're still seeing this. There is promise. Um, data is still coming out. Um, so it is something to look at. The challenge with that is obviously it's cash. Yeah. Um, but it, early in the disease, yes, it, it, there is some promising early data that shows it can help. Late, no, it's a waste of money. All right, well, that, those are the only questions we had. I'd, I'd like to thank our three uh, sports spine and joint uh, uh, partners for a great talk tonight. Um, we will uh, post the slides uh, on my COPC eventually, um, but we'll probably won't be until all of the lectures are done. So thanks everybody for joining us and thank you for the lectures.